Good morning and welcome to this webinar on Penn State University engagement opportunities for the plastics industry. My name is Heidi Shattuck and I'll be your host today. Um, to pass the time while we wait for everyone to join, uh, I'd like to pose a question for our attendees from industry. What's the biggest business challenge you're facing right now? Is it workforce shortages, supply chain, or is it something else? Um, feel free to, to answer in the chat box. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And welcome to this webinar on Penn State University engagement opportunities for the plastics industry. My name is Heidi Shattuck and I'll be your host today. So before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Uh, all of our attendees are automatically muted and your cameras are turned off. If you have any technical difficulties with accessing or hearing the presentation, just use the chat pad and we'll try to correct them promptly. Attendees can submit questions at any time during this 40 to 50 minute presentation using the Q&A button, but we'd like to wait until our Q&A period at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. This will allow us to move through the material more efficiently. If you have any questions after the webinar is over, please send them to us via email at pentap at psu.edu. This webinar is being recorded and it'll be uploaded on the Pentap website. All attendees will receive a follow-up email notifying you when the recording is available. On today's webinar, we will have a guest presenter from Penn State's Barron campus in Erie. Jason Williams is an assistant teaching professor of engineering at Penn State Barron. Jason has been designing plastic products for over 25 years. After graduation from Penn State's Plastics Engineering Technology Program, he worked for the university before starting his own product development firm. The company consulted with many manufacturers to help them design plastics products in the toy, consumer products, medical, and industrial markets. Jason joined Penn State in 2008 and teaches courses in product design and development, plastic part design, and plastic process simulation. He's also an active researcher in the areas of process effects on material properties and developing novel processes using additive manufacturing. Outside of work, he enjoys building computers, gaming, cooking, and working around the house. Again, my name is Heidi Shattuck, and I'm a technical advisor with PenTap. My role is to help build and manage relationships between Penn State University and small to mid-sized businesses across the state. So first in our webinar today, I'll describe ways that PenTap can help identify no cost and low cost ways to improve your business through our direct technical assistance, referrals to resource partner networks, and engagement with Penn State students, faculty, and facilities. Then we'll be joined by Jason Williams to discuss university engagement opportunities for the plastics industry, and we'll end with a Q&A session. So let's get started with a little bit about PenTap. The Pennsylvania Technical Assistance Program at Penn State, known as PenTap, is a statewide technical assistance organization charged with supporting Pennsylvania businesses and anchor institutions, including manufacturers, municipalities, educational institutions, entrepreneurs, and economic development agencies. 
we began over 50 years ago as one of the first technical assistance programs in the country. PennTap focuses on bringing Pennsylvania businesses, focuses on helping Pennsylvania businesses through two primary areas of expertise, energy and operational assessments and university connections. Through these pillars, our goal is to help your business be successful and drive economic growth in Pennsylvania. You can find us at pentap.psu.edu. We have a diverse staff with backgrounds in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, environmental science, manufacturing, management, urban design, and economics. Our staff includes a certified energy auditor, certified energy manager, registered environmental auditor, renewable energy professional, a professional geologist, a Six Sigma Green Belt, and a landscape architect. Through our energy and operational assessments, PENTAP's technical advisors perform pollution prevention and energy efficiency assessments, also known as P2E2 assessments, where we help companies decrease pollution and increase energy efficiency. E3 assessments build on the foundation of E2 assessments by incorporating lean manufacturing principles for continuous improvement. The U.S. Department of Energy's ISO 50001 Ready Navigator program enables companies to implement a tailored energy management system, which provides the framework to integrate energy efficiency into your existing management systems. PENTAP is one of a small group of organizations recently selected by DOE to provide training for this pilot program to a cohort of manufacturers. Because of our success so far with this pilot program, DOE has asked PENTAP to gather input and feedback from ISO 14001 certified companies with the goal of identifying overlap between the two standards and potentially integrating them in the future. Here's a great example of how PENTAP's energy services benefited a Pennsylvania plastics manufacturer. In 2018, a PENTAP advisor and a group of Penn State engineering students teamed up with the Northeast Industrial Resource Center to help Bemis, a polyethylene packaging company, to combine a lean management project with an energy audit to assess ways to reduce waste and energy consumption through value stream mapping and continuous improvement techniques. The team identified opportunities to recover and reuse waste heat from processes, reduce leaks in the compressed air system, an upgrade to more ener energy efficient lighting. Based on the team's lean management recommendations, Bemis planned to develop a continuous flow process to create more efficient schedules and reduce downtime. Bemis also identified opportunities to reduce press downtime through standardization and add preventative maintenance to improve press speed. Recommended changes from the energy audit portion of the project totaled nearly $80,000 worth of annual savings with a projected payback period of one year. Beyond energy, we work closely with our clients to understand the full range of their business needs and facilitate innovation by creating connections back to the university and our vast network of resource partners across the state. PENTAP can provide your business with no cost and low cost opportunities to engage with Penn State students, faculty, and facilities. Penn State classroom projects and capstone courses provide great opportunities for companies to tackle complex problems using classroom knowledge and world renowned facilities. PENTAP has enabled connections to the university for a variety of, of industry sponsored projects, including product development through prototyping at the Learning Factory improved production flow through Six Sigma student projects in the industrial engineering classroom, and growth into new markets with market research completed by the Smeal College of Business Nittany Lion Consulting Group. PENTAP has grant funding to offset the sponsorship fees for Penn State capstone projects, which would allow a select number of industry sponsors to take advantage of this resource at a reduced cost. PENTAP also works very hard to connect our industry clients with research partnership opportunities, such as the Manufacturing PA Innovation Program, 
which is a collaborative effort between state government, academia, and industry to drive new technologies and processes in the manufacturing sector. The Small Business Innovation Research Program, or SBIR, funds small businesses to stimulate technological innovation to meet federal research and development needs and increase commercialization. PennTAP's direct connection with Penn State researchers allows us to make the right connections to faculty for small businesses to meet the requirements for university participation in these programs. PennTAP maintains relationships with a wide range of resource partners across the state. These resource partners bring different tool sets to complement PennTAP's suite of services. Our resource partners include small business development centers, industrial resource centers, Ben Franklin Technology Partners, local development districts, the Strategic Early Warning Network, and others. With technical advisors in every region of the state, PennTAP can help you make personal connections to the economic development representatives working in your area. Our relationships with these partners are vital for Pennsylvania businesses. As you can see, PennTAP created a significant impact across the state in 2021. We generated $5.2 million of economic benefit, and we helped to save or create 64 jobs across 33 counties. We're very proud of the work we do every day to educate the public about the support and resources available in our state, and we're proud to serve as a gateway for businesses to collaborate with Penn State University. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our guest presenter, Jason Williams, so he can tell you all about Penn State engagement opportunities for the plastics industry. Thanks for joining us today, Jason. The floor is all yours. All right. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to request some remote control here. The uh, So I'm assuming, oh, that, that, too far, Jason. There it is. So like Heidi introduced myself, I'm Jason Williams. I teach in the plastics program here at the Erie campus of Penn State. Um, and as you said, I've been around the plastics industry throughout my career. I graduated from Penn State in 92. I had been working on campus. I did outreach. I've worked with PennTap since the early 90s as well. So I've helped. So I've been around this, this environment for a long time. And I, I invite you to take my email down. And if you have questions, you can throw them up in chat. Um, and we can all, I'll try to integrate those if they make sense. If not, I'll push those to the end of the Q&A. Um, but anyway, I wanted to introduce um, the, the our university. I see some familiar names in the participant list. Hi, David. Um, and then uh, talk a bit about more of the plastics engineering program and some example collaborations we've had on some on some ongoing research work that we do. Uh, talk about our facilities a little bit, and then describe ways in which you can interact or um, work with us at our campus here. So um, that said, <clears throat> this slide I like to put in because it kind of shows the breadth, for those of you who aren't aware, the breadth of the university, we cover the state. And the campus I'm at is way up in little old Erie on the lake, which looking out the window today, it's beautiful and sunny. And then close to 60, which believe it or not, there's no snow on the ground. For those of you in the rest of the state, we had quite a bit there, year, but um, the the Barron campus actually started uh, in the late 40s. It was a in the upper picture there. You can see it looks like a farmhouse because that's what it was originally. It was a um, a farm that was donated by the founders of Hammermill Paper. They donated it to the university and land wise. We've grown over the years. We have about 860 acres. Um, we have four schools at our campus, about 4,600 students and degrees across all of those. So I like to think of us as a little bit of a little baby university that's buried within the large university. So it's, it's <clears throat> I also like to think of us as that sort of small university with the resources of a massive university. So, and that plays into our research, which we'll talk about as we get there. Um, within the, the Barron College, we have the School of Engineering, which as which I'm a part of, um, which we have about 1600 students in there. Um, and 
degrees across a whole bunch of programs with some unique programs to our campus, particularly plastics and software engineering. Um, and then the plastics program itself, so plastics engineering technology, it started, it was really became an outgrowth of um, an outgrowth of the regional industry in the late 80s. They had a real need for um, educated engineers that could come in and make an immediate impact in their uh, in their companies. So they approached the university. The university, I think, somewhat dismissively said, well, come back with a million dollars and we'll see what we can do. And the, the companies in the region, the Northwestern Pennsylvania region got together. They came back, I think, with a, with a couple million dollars and said, well, here we are. And so that put together a program. Um, the, so from day one, this plastics engineering technology program has been really grounded in, <clears throat> excuse me, in direct industry interaction, direct industry impact. Um, the picture here is actually of our current plastics lab. It's a little bit older picture. A lot of that equipment's been moved out with replaced with newer equipment. But when you look at it, the one thing you'll take away, and I'm sure I'll repeat myself a couple times today, is that it really is a factory with a science lab attached to it. It was, there's a large crane we use to move equipment across. I mean, it it really is a set up to be modeled after a, a, a modern manufacturing facility. Um, the coursework in the in the degree program, and I, I, I'm spending some time on this for a couple of reasons. One, it plays into how we do our research. It also plays into how we think of industry interaction because it carries into from the teaching to this this industry interaction. So the program itself has courses in materials, so so plastics materials, courses in part design, processing, and tool design. We teach this this idea of the four legs of the stool because really to be effective in any one of these areas, you need to be somewhat well versed in the other three. So, for example, my background is all product development, part design. I haven't run an injection molding machine in years. In fact, they really only let me in the lab when they want an injection molding machine broken because I don't run them. However, when I was a student, I spent, gosh, several semesters learning to run injection molding machines. And that experience has led me to be a better product designer because I understand the plastics molding process. I can change part properties drastically just by processing alone, just, just by changing factors in the process. I can change how that product will, will behave, right? Tool design is another one. I can't be a good product designer if I don't understand the manufacture of tools. Because if I can't build a tool, I can't build a part, and I don't have a product. So with that, when we engage with industry, we think on all four of these legs. When we engage students in, in industry-sponsored research, these, this is what we're expecting of, of the students. So um, this sort of theory, as you can see, is ingrained in us as an institution for many years. So. Um, now, to continue that trend, this past year, we started a second degree program, a bachelor's in polymer engineering and science. And I like to think of it as a sister program or a sibling of the PLET program, um, because this program is based, again, it was a result of an industry need. We, our research partners, have grown over the years and our employers have grown over the years and we've moved into um, we've moved from sort of a lot of regional support we still have a lot of companies that hire students regionally but we're seeing more national companies hire and recruit at our campus so what this leads to is them asking questions um, about and we get companies such as material suppliers coming then to higher on campus or companies that are developing their own materials and compounds, but they don't need a traditional polymer scientist. They need somebody to help scale that into industrial level production 
of a material or an application of a material to it to a, um, to an industrial scale process. So these students coming through this program, they work hand in hand with the PLET students and vice versa. Um, our first couple of students in this program are currently doing a joint senior capstone project with PLET students. And so um, we very much want these to be sort of somewhat intertwined programs. The faculty are kind of jointly teaching across the two programs, which is nice. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The, um, so this program is a bit more geared towards the materials aspect of the properties. What we were running into is we were getting requests. So I'll add this to the PLET program and add this, but the PLET program is already one of the heaviest credit loaded programs in the system in the Penn State system. So we obviously were not able to cram anything more in. So that led us to creating this more specialized program. Um, for teaching these programs and as well as for industry interaction, I, I want to get back to this idea of this factory floor with a um, with a science lab sort of attached to it. And I kind of say this a little bit that our science lab extends all the way to University Park. And we'll see that as we talk to our research uh, pieces as we go forward here a little bit. So in looking at this here, we've got our main processing lab. This is about 10,000 square feet. Um, and the picture taken before was taken from up here on this little um, platform looking the other direction. So uh, this end of the lab is mostly injection molding. And so we have injection molding machines, um, most of which are on consignment from the manufacturers. So for example, um, Arberg, we have a long standing relationship with Arberg um, and they will put their injection molding machines in here. They'll leave them for two to three years on a consignment basis and replace them with new equipment as they come and go. So um, most of the machinery in our lab is probably less than two to three years old. Um, and we have equipment ranging in size from, I think our smallest press is in the 10 ton range to I think our largest is 240 ton. Um, we have multi-material capabilities. We have in-mold foaming capabilities. We have a lot of technology um, partners that will put equipment in here. So from two aspects, one would be our students learning on it because when they get hired into companies, they're the ones specifying equipment to be purchased or helping companies lay out equipment. And the students will have experience on many different manufacturers of equipment. So that way it is, you know, the, the companies putting the equipment on consignment like it because they might specify their equipment. So we also have it as a variety because we do an extensive uh, or we have an extensive continuing education program. And so we have uh, we have representatives from companies all over the country coming in for training on a regular basis. And it's good exposure again for the companies. The other areas in the lab in this area, we have a large tooling. So we have we inherit molds from inje other injection molders. Um, at the far end of the lab, here we've got um, blow molding. Uh, we've got film lines, cast film, blown film, uh, extrusion. Um, kind of off the camera, but kind of in this area, we have a compounding area we use for material development. And when I say material, it's not developing necessarily new plastics. It's for developing, say, compounds <clears throat> or blending materials, working with additives, designing different filler systems. So we have some, uh, some extensive compounding equipment. We also have some additive manufacturing in that region. So we do a lot with additive manufacturing. We've had additive manufacturing on campus. My first job was running a stereolithography printer in 1991. So we've had that technology around for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> off to the side here. So there's side doors or side rooms underneath this space. 
And <clears throat> that's where the labs below that you see here. So we have the ability to make lots of equipment or make lots of parts or work with plastics in interesting ways. But we also are very curious from a scientific perspective as to how those properties or how the, the process affects those material properties. And so um, that could be as simple as just looking at how does this processing change the tensile strength or the flexural strength of my particular plastic products. So we have traditional tensile testing equipment and equipment like that to how does it affect it on a, micro, a microscopic level or a molecular level. So this is where we start to dig into things in a little bit more detail. We have some uh, differential scanning calorimetry. In fact, the one there, the flash DSC, um, we have two of maybe two dozen flash DSC instruments in the world or in the country rather. Um, it's a ultra fast way of analyzing material that allows us to replicate industrial processes in the lab. Um, so we have FTIR, dynamic mechanical analysis, so we can look at how do plastic properties change with temperature and, and, um, and time. And then um, thermogravimetric analysis, uh, the ESEM is electron or uh, elemental scanning electron microscopy. So we can look at things very closely. That's, that's this instrument sitting here. This is, we have one here, but then through the material characterization labs at University Park, there's a whole host of additional microscopy techniques and analysis techniques that we can leverage as part of our research. So we can go anywhere from very fundamental um, research all the way through full scale manufacturing research. Um, so it's kind of a neat way to do things. Um, so continuing education, um, so this gets into some topics on how do we interact with industry. So continuing education is one level of engagement with the university. We have what we call the Plastics Training Academy, and this is an annual offering. So the link there that psu.edu slash plastics will take you to that, um, those course offerings for it. We can also do custom training. I do Maybe about once a year, I end up doing a custom course on plastic part design for companies where maybe I focus on a particular topic. Um, we have processing related courses. So if you are running, doing plastic manufacturing in house, we have a wide variety of different courses that we do on site here in our labs, or we've done them on site at customer facilities. So um, we have courses as well as the materials. So it's a whole host of things. So the continuing education, if you have questions about that, feel free to email me as well. I can forward it to the right people on that one. Um, so in terms of collaboration, this is a little bit of a picture of some of our collaborators we've worked with on some of the research, um, kind of looking at Invista as a material supplier, GM, I think everybody should be aware of. We've done a lot of work with GM. They've donated several pieces of equipment to the lab. Um, we, one of their head researchers for their plastics, he usually shows up here about once a month or so to just work in the lab with the students. And um, so we have a very good relationship with them. Emrys is another uh, uh, supplier of materials, SKF makes bearings. I'll talk about the SKF interaction a little bit more is because it's a good example of how broad of a research engagement we can have with a company. Um, Autodesk, Boldflow, and Moldex 3D. So these companies manufacture uh, process simulation software. So for example, Autodesk's Moldflow, they've donated their software to the university for gosh, 30 years. And <clears throat> we've been teaching it. We work with them extensively. So Cabestro, obviously Penn State. Um, this Instituto Plumieri, this is uh, out of Italy. It's a research institute out of Italy we work closely with. So we have relationships kind of all over the world in this space. Um, an example, oops, too far. An example project, and this is a broader project. This has been going on for several years now. 
and it just kind of keeps expanding is our relationship with SKF. And you can see in this picture, it bridges horizontally here all the way from SKF's regional facility. They have a facility about 40 miles from here. And um, we work pretty, we started with that organization. And as the research has grown, it now we work all the way across the low, the all through the US as well as their global research facility. In fact, we've had several students do internships at their global facility outside Amsterdam. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And it also, so it, it's really reached across their entire organization, um, but it's also reached across our entire organization on this vertical axis. So what started at this Barron campus is now extended to University Park where it's done at least two graduate students or graduate programs um, across the two campuses. It's employed over 10 undergraduate students. Um, there's been at least four faculty involved with this work over the years. So, and this is a project that's really started with, a, you know, looking at these materials that are used in the bearings. Um, and it started with some um, failure analysis on some of the materials. So why was why were they having trouble with this one particular material? And it starts with the obvious, like how's the manufacturing process work? So we do studies on that. But then it starts to ask the question, well, what's going on at the molecular level? Well, how is the process of manufacturing this affecting how this material behaves? And that's where we start to engage with the University Park and the Material Science Department, also the Material Research Institute. And it what I love about this is it's it really shows how Penn State is one university across the entire state. So I like to think of it as Penn State being we have one big campus. It just happens to have the same land mass as the entire state of Pennsylvania. So um, it's been a really good engagement in that regard. And it started with a small corporate engagement and has expanded into this large uh, mutually beneficial arrangement. Um, Emirates is another one that goes across the university. Um, in this case, we've been looking at working with their minerals to develop composite systems. Um, this was a one year program. It was mostly around some microscopy and mechanical testing and some molding of samples. So instead of a traditional say polymer science environment where you might do some compounding and maybe some compression molding to make sample plaques or something like this. Um, in this case, we would compound larger samples it's using industrial processes and then form those into to products through injection molding which is representative of how actual products that we manufactured so we can see how these composite structures hold up in a true manufacturing environment so it's a good scale up type of work um oops too far oh i gotta stop using the roller there we go another place this is another opportunity for engagement oh. With the university and it's this eric center this advanced resource efficiency center um and <clears throat> there's actually two components to it to it within the university um which i'll talk about in a minute the eric center itself is based out of the university of sheffield in the uk and they have extensions in china europe um, the focus is really on sort of developing supply chain efficiency but also from a sustainable standpoint. So they have life cycle analysis is a big part of this work. So we are focused on, um, at our campus focused on sustainable and, um, and polymer life cycle analyses based around the polymers and plastics industry. Um, I think at University Park, they have an outreach of this Eric Center that's based around energy usage. Um, but there's a whole software suite. If this area is of interest to you, let me know and I can put you in touch with the faculty member running this at our campus in terms of polymers and plastics. Um, because I will be clear in that this is not exactly my forte, but it's a fairly exciting thing that we're involved with. Um, 
on the smaller scale of things, when COVID-19 reared its head, which doesn't feel like two years ago, it's been kind of a blur, um, there were shortages of things and, and personal protective equipment. And this is just an example of how we can respond very quickly. This is a joint thing between Pent, our campus, Case Western and Cleveland and Nottingham Spurk, which is a design consultancy in the Cleveland region. And within three weeks, we went from an idea to actually manufacturing and, and distributing face shields. Um, the, this was one of the things where these universities, we came together through our contacts and our local manufacturers. Uh, the mold, the injection mold was built um, locally in five days. Now they had a mold base in house. So was, there's, and the design was designed to be very simple to, to manufacture the mold for, but um, the, the shield, the front shield itself was sourced locally um, very quickly. So, and the rubber strap came from a company over in Cleveland. Um, so this was something put together very rapidly. So this, I like this example because it shows how closely we can work with other universities as well as regional and national manufacturers. So this was, I will also say that timeline was extremely aggressive. If you're, I saw the um, Sean's question in, in the chat about manufacturing a product. Sean, do not take this as an example of how fast you can get your product manufactured. <laughs> so um, anyway, so to kind of summarize some of this and ways that you can engage with the university, obviously our favorite way is recruitment because my primary job is to help students learn and become prepared for industry. So obviously that's a quick way you can in, bring some of our expertise into your facilities through you know, internships, our plastics programs are both set up for co-op experiences, which would be a summer and an adjacent uh, semester. So either spring, summer or summer, fall. Um, obviously full-time employment is, is nice. Um, However, most, or not to say just most, many of our students end up choosing their full-time position based on what internships they do. Um, it's not uncommon for us to have juniors that are already locked into a full-time position upon graduation. Um, our programs had 100% placement since it was established. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, unfortunately, for the, on the recruitment side for the employers, uh, lot, many of our students often find themselves in a place of having multiple job offers, um, but the internship piece can go a long way to helping with that. Um, workforce development, obviously that's another easy way to help, uh, or not so much help, but to get engaged with us. The other one would be senior projects. So senior capstone projects within the plastics engineering technology program and the polymer engineering science our senior capstone projects are actually three semesters long um, and they start, we, since we have many students that are in co-ops, we have a lot of students that are out of sync. So we st we're starting senior projects every, every fall and spring. So we usually have some open projects. These are predominantly led by the undergraduate students. Um, we usually put two to three students on our senior projects and the, the, the scope, it could be design programs. So I've got, I'm trying to think of my senior projects. I've got one senior project right now that is a few students that are developing ways to use, to look at using additive manufacturing of plastic mold cavities to, to try to uh, basically print molds, injection molds directly for testing things. We've got um, other senior projects um, going, going through my head right now, working with, we have a super mileage club on campus. They're doing some stuff developing um, ways to manufacture some parts for that. Those we've had one senior project that was looking with a local startup that's looking for an alternative way to make uh, panels. They were using a, a natural fiber to make wood wood like panels. Um, 
So they kind of run the gamut on, on project. I, we can help you coach those in. These, however, I rec because we need to give the rooms, the students room to run their own project, which means they have the potential to not be successful if they don't do their work. Um, so I recommend these not be high priority projects. I, I, these are great projects for the, boy, it'd really nice to know, or we'd really like to develop this, but it's, it doesn't need to be done tomorrow. <clears throat> Those categories fit really nicely with us. Um, and that, but if the priority does warrant, we get into sponsored research projects. So these are now faculty led projects. We try to incorporate undergraduate researchers whenever possible. We're very bullish on trying to incorporate students whenever possible into these kinds of research projects. Cause you know, our job again, getting back to that first piece is, is recruitment and building students that can make a difference. So if we can pull them into these projects, it could be um, really beneficial for the students and the employer uh, or for the sponsor. Um, these projects also now can get into, it's not that the senior projects can't, it's just that they don't often as much, but get into the much deeper resources of the Penn State system. So this includes the material, uh, material uh, characterization labs. Although I have a group this semester and the senior project class that will be using some equipment there. Um, so as well as other creating joint programs between the different disciplines. So the sponsored research um, becomes the sort of the, the big dog, I guess. It's when I have to pull out those, then we can do that. But my advice is if you have questions, and we're gonna have a little time here in a little bit, so we can talk about that. So anyway, that's what I wanted to do to kind of introduce everybody to this. <laughs> um, Jason, that was that was spot on. Um, I think that was a lot of information, a lot of, I, I personally thought really great and useful information that I, I think speaks directly to uh, the folks that we have in our, our audience today. So thank you so much for that. So one of the, one of the questions that I have for you, I don't see anything in the Q&A box, Okay. Um, but just based on, you know, you said that the Barron campus in particular has some real strengths and specialization, obviously, in plastics, um, but you also mentioned software engineering department. Yes. Um, and so I'm just, I'm curious, what kind of, you know, implications or, or opportunities do you see specifically with, like, combining the, the strength of those two departments for, for industry in terms of like industry 4.0 or data analytics or technological innovation in general in the plastics industry? Yeah, it gets a little outside of my wheelhouse, but I know we've been doing some, there's some other faculty in campus here that have been work, doing work in industry 4.0. Um, one of the other faculty in our department actually has a project ongoing with a local plastics manufacturer to develop some industry 4.0 and process monitoring. So, mm -hmm. um, I haven't personally haven't done a lot with that, but I know we have a lot of experience with that, at least through that other faculty member. He got a grant to work with a local manufacturer to develop some of this technology. We have a uh, another faculty member that's working on some machine learning technology um, in one of the other departments. But then the where the collaboration comes in nice between the departments is because we have this in sort of, I guess, small manufacturing facility in the lab, it gives us the opportunity to, to set experiments up on in industrial scale equipment. And, okay. Which gives us some other space. Okay. I would encourage if people have interest in that, let me know and I'll see if I can find the right pe person for you. Okay. No, that's great. Um, one other thing I was, I was curious about, um, you know, first of all, I love I love the examples that you presented of the the different levels of engagement, um, like with SKF and, and the other companies that you mentioned. Um, I'm I'm curious if you if there are any kind of projects or companies that are too small, in your opinion, to engage um, with university. I mean, are um, there are there projects or companies um, like startups that just 
aren't a good fit here or can you can you find a, a place for well, everybody startups especially if it's a new product startup i usually will guide them to what we have we have a group in the other part of the building here called the innovation commons where it's effectively it's a it's a product development sort of ring that's kind of run by students i advise some of the students in that they do a lot of additive manufacturing at no cost to people or inventors or or companies that are looking to explore the technology uh they've got a whole host of different additive manufacturing equipment down there um we just put a ceramic printer in down there so we've been working with that and we have a couple student built printers down there and when i say student built the one was designed and built completely by students and it, it can print a one cubic meter its build area is a cubic meter so it can print very large parts um so a lot of times the inventors i'll push them to that they're part of this this beehive innovation network mm -hmm. that's um in our region it's with a couple of the universities so we have another university that's a part of this that will help uh inventors and in, in new startups with business issues or there's another university that'll help them with sort of the graphics and sort of the the marketing materials for their their startup and all of that's at no cost um in fact i think we just got for the innovation commons here we just got they just announced in fact it was on penn state today the other day they got like a two million dollar endowment yeah i saw that yeah, so that's, that's big news that's today. available that's available to the state of pennsylvania so um it's a nice it's a nice opportunity so it, at the small end there's that the one area that i do try to shoo people and i don't want to say shoo people away, i help guide them to better sources would be just straight testing so we i had an inquiry the other day can you do some some polymer testing for me that's not really what we're here to do because the students don't really learn a whole lot from something like that. There's not a lot of discovery in something like that. And we're really not equipped to be just a material testing lab. So in those cases, I usually direct company or direct people to different commercial testing facilities. Cause I don't want to be, that's the other piece is I'm trying not to compete with the commercial testing lab. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not my space that, I mean, there's better sources for that. Now, if there's a deeper question that needs to be answered and it requires some material testing, that's when we do get involved. Like if they're having problems with a particular piece and I can get some students on it and maybe have a faculty member be an advisor for that. In those cases, um, those get a bit more interesting, but no, we can work with all scales of projects. I just did a short consulting thing last fall for about $2,500 helping with the material selection on a new consumer product okay so the engagement runs that it goes all over the place runs the gamut yeah great well thanks for that yeah. um that that definitely answers my question one last thing real quick is you know in our recent conversation you you mentioned to me that you saw that you were encouraged that you were seeing a lot of reshoring taking place mm -hmm. since covid um in the plastics industry can you just talk for a quick minute about what you see there as as opportunities and in, in that regard um yeah, this is a bit anecdotal, but um, because I haven't looked into the, the hard data of which this is more talking to my connections in the industry that I look around here, I see a lot with the tool makers of products coming back uh, stateside. I think a lot of it, uh, the other thing driving you see is the supply chain issues of trying to get things back and shipping back into the states. Um, so we're seeing some of that. Most of the companies, at least that I've been working with recently, are stay quite fast or stay quite are staying quite busy. Sorry. Okay. Getting marbles in my mouth. Good. Good. All right. Well, thank you again very much. Um, I think that this was really informative. Um, uh, your contact information is on here. Like we said, the the. The webinar is recorded it will be arch archived on our website so anybody can come back and view at any time and, and, and grab some additional information or contact information out of that. We do like to wrap things up with a, a few key takeaways um, for everyone so just first of all uh, should be clear at this point Penn State has some great state of the art facilities that are open um, for your organization to utilize in partnership with Penn State. 
Uh, there's lots of ways for you in the plastics industry to engage with with Penn State Barron, uh, from recruitment and workforce development to senior capstone design projects um, and sponsored research. And you know, finally, PenTap's goal is to help you grow and sustain your business by connecting you to the vast array of resources available at the university um, all across the state. So before we conclude, I'll, I'll just tell you real quick about a couple of other PenTap webinars from the past year that you might find interesting. Recordings of both of these are available on our website. Um, on July 17th, last year, we hosted a webinar titled Pathways to Smart Manufacturing Through Smart Maintenance. PENTAP was joined by Dr. Vital Prabhu, who described the processes by which manufacturers can begin to develop a smart maintenance program using data and ways Penn State can assist companies with this transition to smart maintenance. And last month, we presented a webinar titled Energy and Waste Reduction Through Continuous Improvement, in which we discussed pairing energy con conservation and waste reduction with continuous improvement through lean management strategies. So be sure to check our website to stay connected and be informed of upcoming PENTAP news webinars and workshops. Um, here's my contact information. And thank you all so much for attending today's webinar. And I hope you have a wonderful St. Patty's Day. Thank you. Thank you.